This is Derek Walker, the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church, and this is our weekly Bible study in the book of Psalms, and we are now in Psalm 49. Let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for the wisdom in this psalm. We pray that you reveal it to each one of us, that we will have wisdom and understanding in, in our faith, in our life, that we will not trust in riches, but we trust in the living God who has redeemed us. Thank you, Lord, for this psalm and the way it is so powerful in the way it speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, Psalm 49, again, is, is a different, is different psalm. It is a very much a wisdom psalm. And it, it is, in many ways, the, somebody said, the high watermark of Old Testament faith as far as the life after death is concerned. And we're going to start with the title. It's to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. In fact, the last few psalms we're in has, has been a whole string of psalms up to this point, which are of the sons of Korah, I think, starting in Psalm 42. And um, it's got three main sections. The introduction, which is the first four verses, is re- he's really building up the suspense, telling us that he's got something really important to share with us. And then he delivers by uh, g- giving us uh, two main sections. One finishes with verse 12, and the other finishes in verse 20. And we know that they are, it's structured this way because of what's called a refrain. A refrain is a repeating phrase. And, and in verse 12 and verse 20 is a very similar, not quite the same phrase, which really descri- basically says that all men die like, like beasts, like animals. Um, and, and we'll explain this. Uh, and so the big issue is actually... Uh, the big revelation in this psalm is what happens after death, both for the righteous and for the unrighteous, both for those who, who trust in, in the Lord for their salvation or versus those who trust in the things of this world, that, that in their riches and so forth. And so he presents this psalm in a very interesting way. Let's look at the introduction, first of all, the first four verses. And as I said, he is really emphasizing the importance of the psalm and what he has to say. And um, I'll I'll also say that uh, it's kind of like Psalm 37 and Psalm 73. All these three psalms actually deal with the, the problem, if you like, of the prosperity of the wicked. And and what that means is that there are many people who seem to be doing very well in the world, they're they're prosperous, they're successful, they're powerful, and yet they're they're wicked, they're godless, They, they don't love God, they don't follow God, they're in for it for themselves, and yet they seem to be doing so well. And often they are the ones who are... In, in order to get more wealth and have their own way, use and abuse those who, who are poor and weak and so forth. And it seems like they're getting away with it. So that, that creates a, pr- a problem, a moral problem. Is, you know, why does God allow this to happen? Um, and it, it, it is a temptation for us when we see certain people acting wrongly and yet thriving from it, uh, from their Ill, illicit gains. There's a temptation there to, to be like them and, and to follow them in, in their sin. Um, there's a temptation to think that, you know, righteousness doesn't pay. There's, you know, a, a, te- a temptation to just to be upset with, with God for, uh, for letting this happen. So how, how do we handle that? as believers and this psalm helps us to handle that mostly by giving us the eternal perspective that in the end the wicked will be judged and in the end the righteous will be blessed and rewarded eternally all right so let's look at the introduction and let's see how he is really setting this up as something very important that he's presenting here. He says, hear this, all all people. You need to listen. 
give ear. Uh, give, give your ears, give your attention. All inhabitants of the world. So what he's saying here is so important. It's for everyone in the whole world to hear. Uh, and it's important for everyone. And when it says the, the all inhabitants of the world, this word emphasizes the fact that this world is, trans, you know, is, is, is transitory. And, and therefore, you can't base your future, your eternity, on the things of this world. You've got to have a spiritual understanding that goes beyond that. And then he, he emphasizes it's all people. He says both high and low, both low and high, rich and poor together. He says, I'm, I'm talking to you whether you're low or high. And that's kind of talking about the difference of, of status and power. And, and also rich and poor. Everyone. This applies to everyone. He says, verse 3, my mouth shall speak wisdom. But it's actually in the plural, wisdoms. And, and what, what this means is it, the plural means intensity. In other words, great wisdom. I am going to share something to you of great and important wisdom. And then he says, and the meditations, literally it's meditations, of my heart shall give understanding. And again, it's literally understandings. In other words, I'm going to, this has come from the meditation of my heart and it is going to impart to you very great, very important understanding. And, and this is somewhat like the book of Proverbs. It's the same kind of language here where this is kind of wisdom language, you know, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and so forth. And um, Proverbs starts in a similar way. And then he says in verse 4, I will incline my ear to a proverb. Now, the, the proverb... Uh, is 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 basically in, this psalm is 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 teaching um, a spiritual truth for wisdom. So Proverbs is, is the book of Proverbs has has a collection of many of these sayings, but the word proverb can also mean you know a bigger teaching uh, that is designed to impart wisdom. And and I like the way he says it. I will incline my ear to a proverb. In other words, he's saying. I'm not just making this stuff up, all right? I have inclined my ear. I have sought God, and I have tried to listen to God and listen to what God has spoke, speaks to me and reveals to me. And, and if you are to be a, a teacher of God's word, teacher of wisdom, you have to first of all hear what God says before you, you give that. You don't, it's not about giving your own thoughts. So he says, I, I incline my ear to a proverb. And he says, now, as a result, I will disclose my dark saying. And um, this word disclose means to open. In other words, to make it clear, to expound my hard saying. A, a better translation for dark saying would be riddle. You know, the idea of a riddle is when you, you say something, or it could be a a hard question. You know, I remember Samson gave a riddle. You know, you, 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 you make a, a statement and then it's designed for people to, to think about how can this statement be true? Um, and, and that makes them think about the, the subject until they find that the answer that, that fits the riddle. And so <clears throat> what he's going to say is, I am going to present to you a hard question. Uh, uh, something that is not easily explained, but when you and and I will give you the explanation. I will open it to you. I'll disclose it to you. And um, he says, "I'll do it on the harp." So <laughs> this is actually quite unique in the sense that th this is not just wisdom teaching, but this is a wisdom in a, in a song, like in a, a long ballad, you know, that they used to to write, that that carries this the wisdom here. Um, the New English Bible says, I will tell on the harp how I read the riddle. And the riddle, and, and people argue, what, what is this riddle? But I believe it's verse 5 and 6. I believe verse 5 and 6 tells us the riddle. Um, and he said, let me just read it to you first of all. Why should I fear in the days of evil when the iniquity at my heels surrounds me those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches. Now, 
what he is making a statement, the riddle or this hard question is, this is, if you like, his, his statement. Why should I fear? In the days of evil, and the next line probably should be translated, when the iniquity of those who cheat me or supplant me or persecute me surrounds me. So he's really saying, I, through what I now understand, I do not fear, all right, in the days of evil, when there are wicked people um, sinning uh, and using their wealth and their power to cheat me, to do, do me evil, to supplant me. Um, because he clarifies in verse 6 the type of people that are, are attacking him. Though they are those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches. And in this psalm, he's, he's particularly talking about people who trust in their wealth. They trust in the things they have accumulated in this life. They trust in their status in this life. And they then use that against others. And he, the Bible does not say wealth is bad. It's not wrong to be wealthy. In fact, Abraham and David were probably billionaires, according to our reckoning nowadays. It's not the issue is not whether you have wealth, but whether wealth has you. Are you a lover of money? Do you trust in riches? In other words, is that wealth your idol? Because Jesus said, a man cannot love and serve God and mammon, that is the things of this world. You can't do both. You'll either love one or hate the other. In other words, we are to love God with all our heart. We're to trust in God. We're to be attached to God. And yes, we use money. We, we can enjoy that money and all the rest of it, but it's not our God. But the danger is that people who are godless, they, they love this world and what this world has to offer, especially money, and that becomes their idol. And they love it and they serve it, and that's what motivates and drives them in their life. And that's the person that he's talking about. Those who trust in their wealth, they think somehow their wealth will makes them secure forever, and they boast in the multitude of their riches. In other words, they boast in their wealth. In other words, they interpret life through their wealth. They get their self-worth through their wealth, and they, that, and they boast in their wealth. In other words, that means, you know, people who are wealthy, they want to show that off, all right, by getting a car, really, that they don't really need, you know, or getting a mansion that they don't really need, or a yacht that they don't really need, or a plane that they don't really need, you know. It's just to show off, to say, look how great I am. You know, they're boasting in their wealth. Again, wealth isn't wrong, but we don't trust in wealth. We shouldn't boast in that wealth because what we're doing is we're making that our idol and that cuts us off from God because you can't be loving money and loving God at the same time, as Jesus said. That's in Matthew 6, by the way, Matthew six twenty four. 24. Um, you have to make a choice. Either God is your God or, or money is your God. And by the way, to be set free from the love of money, it helps to be generous, to, to, give, to give some of that stuff away. Because if you're generous, that breaks the power of that love, that love of money, that, that you want to just hoard everything. All right, so again, let me try and explain this riddle. Um, he is saying, why should I fear in the days of it? Notice it's a riddle. Why should I fear in the days of evil when sinful men are out to get me and are uh, oppressing me? Especially those who, who just covet money and covet their own way. And let me, <laughs> we don't usually speak like this, but what he's, he's saying is that that's the riddle, all right? That's where I've come to in my life. I am, I am not afraid in the days of evil, of, of people like that, abusing their power, abusing their wealth. I am not. And the riddle is why? Why? And he wants people to think about how, how on earth could it be that I could be not vexed, 
not put off, more, not troubled, uh, not fearful uh, in, in that situation. How can it be? That's the riddle for a man to do that. And in the psalm, he will expound this riddle and explain why it's possible to have this attitude. All right, so let's, let's move on now to, we've seen the riddle, and now we are going to the first part of the answer. He, he gives the answer to this riddle, if you like, uh, in two parts. The first part is in verse 7 to 12. And it, he's basically saying here, don't be, don't be too, you know, carried away and distressed by, you know, these wicked uh, rich people. Um, he says the first reason is their wealth gives no advantage to them or no security for them as far as death is concerned. It's a very simple point that he makes, but actually it is very profound. He's saying that death comes to all, and death will come to the rich man as much as to the poor man. It's, it's the great equalizer. And uh, in other words, his, his oppression his, will not last forever. He's going to die just like anyone else dies. And let's have a look at these verses because they have some, some deep teaching in them. Verse 7, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. I prefer an alternative translation, which pretty much means the same thing. He is truly no man can ransom himself or give to God the price of his life. No man can ransom himself or give to God the price of his life. Um, and then he explains that the next part. Well, I'm going to miss out verse 8 because that should be in brackets. I just want you to see the, the whole thought, which is from verse 7 to verse 9. None of them, or truly no man can ransom himself or give to God the price of his life, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. And, and here is the big issue, and he's talking about death and life after death. And he is saying that to pay the price, to redeem, to ransom, a, a man is way beyond the wealth of even the richest man you, his money does not help him escape death and the bigger picture here in the bible uh, and and that that would have been understood i believe by the jews w through the sacrificial system way back in the garden of eden god revealed that the wages of sin is death because Adam sinned, dying you will die. And therefore, as it were, because of man's sin, death, not physical death and spiritual death, the darkness of death has a claim over each and every man. Okay? Uh, death has a claim that un unless the payment for that sin is paid, and, and it's done through an atonement. And what God revealed through the sacrificial system is that there has to be a sacrifice. There has to be one who steps in because man cannot pay the price himself. Uh, God will, has to do it by providing a sacrifice. Who, and through that sacrifice, that payment, that ransom is paid to release us from the dominion of, of sin and death. And, of course, the animal sacrifices were all pictures of the ultimate sacrifice that would actually redeem us, which is the precious blood of Christ himself. Only that is sufficiently precious, sufficiently valuable to pay the price that, that, that to, to, to release us from sin and death. We were, as it were, slaves under the power of sin and death, they had a claim on us, a just claim on us, and that claim can only be satisfied by the payment of a ransom or a redemption that is actually through, through the blood of, of an innocent uh, one. And, of course, we know that Jesus paid that ransom. So what they're saying here is 
the, the foolishness of this wealthy person who puts all his trust in his riches, those riches will only last him for a few years on this earth. But when it comes to his death, um, there is, uh, he can't possibly afford to pay for his forgiveness and his eternal life. And, and, and while he's trusting in his, in his money, he can't put his trust in God. He's, he's, he's so focused on materialism and material things. And we need to be careful because we live in a, the West is very materialistic. And, and so you, you, if you put your trust in, in the world and you're focused on material things, you're not putting your trust in God. And this man's faith will let him down when it comes to it because he doesn't have the money or the wealth, or the goodness, or, or whatever, to redeem himself, to pay that price. Later in the psalm, we're going to see who, who, does, who does pay the price, but he cannot give to God a ransom sufficient. Um, why? Verse 8 explains why. For the redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever. In other words, it's so, it, it takes so much that, that normal gold could never pay it. In fact, if you, if you threw all your money at trying to pay off your sins and pay off, try and push off death, it says it will cease forever. In other words, where it, the effect of your payment would, would, would cease forever. You, you, can, you probably couldn't even buy an extra second uh, of, of life you know, um, because it's so costly. And as we know, only the blood of Christ can, can do that. And verse 9, he says, that he should continue to live eternally. So that's, that's what we, we need. And, and, and this word, to live, really means all the more so. To live all the more so and to live victoriously for in victory forever that's what it means and so there he's saying there there needs to be a ransom for us to to actually escape the clutches of sin and death and to have a glorious everlasting life and the rich man's money that he's been trusting in is not going to do it for him and if that's all he's trusting in then he is going to when death hits he is going to have a terrible eternity we're going to see that in in later in the psalm and so he says in verse, uh, verse 9, notice, that he should continue to live eternally and not see the pit. Now, the pit is what we would call hell. It's the place of destruction. And when the wicked die, the Bible reveals they go down to a place, they go down to the pit. It's actually or called Sheol in the Old Testament. We'll meet it in a few verses' time. And in Hades, it's called Hades. In the, in the Greek, in the New Testament. And in particular, the pit is where the unbelievers go at death. It's that we would call it, we would call it hell. And so, because of sin, because of death, we are, mankind, if it were not for Christ, all mankind would be doomed to go and to, into the pit on death. And the only thing that we can possibly get us out of that pit is the payment of a ransom price to, to compensate, as it were, for our sin for, for, and to pay, pay off that, to release us from bondage. Hallelujah. And if this man who trusts in himself and in his wealth, that... He has got no hope of paying off that price. And that means he's going to go to hell. That, that's the warning here. All right, so what he's saying is the limitations of wealth. If you're trust, putting all your trust in your wealth, in the world, in material things, you may seem to do all right for a few years. But when it comes to your death, you have no advantage over anyone else because you are going down into the pit because you can't possibly, however wealthy you are, you have no advantage. You, you are going to go into the pit. But, th but we'll see that this redemption is something that God will do, and that we'll see that, that God makes available. We'll see that later in the psalm. 
All right. It, it reminds us of a story by of Voltaire, who was a famous French atheist, enemy of Christianity. And he became very wealthy. But when he came to die, he had a horrible death. He cried out to the doctor in, in, in desperation. He says, I'll give you half of everything I possess if you'll just give me six more months of life. And of course, his money couldn't buy him an extra second. Um, and so, v- verse 10, for surely, uh, for, for, now, th- th- some of the verses are, are tricky. I'll give you what I believe they're really saying. V- verse 10 says, for he sees wise men die, likewise the fool and the senseless person perish. So, I, I would put it, like this in terms of the meaning for surely he sees that wise men die likewise the fool and the senseless perish this is just the fact that everyone dies everyone is equal however wealthy you are whether you're wise or foolish we're all going to die all right unless the lord (laughs) comes first and um, he's saying surely it's an obvious fact it's a it's an obvious fact of life but the implication here is about this this man, um, th- this foolish man who trusts in his r- riches, the implication is, although it's an obvious fact, he lives in denial. He lives as if he will live forever. He gives no thought to the fact that he's going to die and the fact that there might, what about his life after death? He makes no preparation. He's so fixated on this life that he makes no preparation for any kind of life after death. And, and, and very foolish. And this is actually how, how people live, you see. They, they don't like to think about death, about their death, about their mortality. A lot of people will avoid that because it's an unpleasant thought. In fact, people don't think about their sin and that there might be consequences to their sin, uh, especially after they die. They don't think about their death. They, they live in a... Uh, bury, they, they, they bury that thought uh, because it's an unpleasant thought, and they just live for, for now. And they, they put their trust in material things. And they, maybe they try and persuade themselves that there is no God or no life after death because they don't want to think about that. And, and the psalmist says, surely he sees that everyone's going to die. But he, and, and this is one truth. When you look at how people live, it reveals what they believe. They might say they believe something, but they actually show how they live, how, what they believe by how they live. And people... Although technically, of course, they know they're going to die, they, they are holding on to this inner thought that they prefer to, that actually I'm, I'm going to just carry on forever. You know, they, 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 they suppress the thought of death uh, because it's unpleasant. And they kind of believe that and they con themselves into that, believing that, and they then live as if they're never going to die. They never think about what's going to happen when they die. Will they meet God? Will there be a price to pay? They don't even give that a thought. And that's what he's saying this foolish man does. And uh, he says, verse 10, he, Surely he sees wise men die, the fool and the senseless perish, and leave their wealth to others. He says, he, he, this is the obvious fact that... It's futile trusting in your wealth because you're all gonna, everyone's going to die, however wealthy they are, and they're going to leave all their wealth to others. Okay? It's, uh, in other words, it's futile trusting in your wealth because there is nothing lasting in that. You won't be able to take it with you. Some, somebody told a story, you know, that uh, some, there was a rich man who died, and they were asking, how much did he take with him? And the person answered, Every, everything, everything, because you can't take anything with you when you die. There used to be an old saying, which was, shrouds have no pockets. 
because they used to bury people in shrouds. You can't take anything with you. So if you're building your life on your physical wealth and your physical status in this life, it's, it's futile. Because everyone's going to die, even the richest person, most famous person's going to die, and they're not going to be able to take anything of that into their afterlife. So if they're basing all their hopes on this life, it is futile. And then verse 11 says, their inner thought is that their houses will last forever. And this could mean, really, that they will just live in their beautiful houses forever. They won't really die. That's their inner thought that they hold on to, and they push away any thoughts of that they're going to die. They, they don't want to think about the fact there might be a life after death. Or it, it, could, it could be, um, and then it says, their dwelling places to all generations. It could mean that they, they kind of secretly imagine they'll just carry on living. They'd make no plans for their death and for life after death. And then it says they call their lands after their own names. So deep, deep down, they, 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 it could also mean the fact that, you know, they know that, okay, they're going to die, but they want to live on forever. So how do they do that? They, they start putting their name on different things. They put their names on pieces of land, on buildings, on institutions. He says, I've got to make a name for myself. Remember Nimrod with Babylon and, and all how the, Alex, Alexander with Alexandria. These, these men who, who were fo focused on their fame and their glory and their wealth in this life, they want to put their name on things so that... When they die, in a sense, they will live on. And, and how foolish is that? What, what good is that? And, in, and this is the same kind of nonsense, and it comes from secular humanism, really, that, that really says materialism, this, this world is all that there is. And yet the human heart desires to live forever. Uh, and so they come up with this feeble uh, thing, to, to try and hold on to this idea of living living forever and and out of that philosophy comes that foolish saying that you see in films when somebody dies oh well never mind they will live on in our memories <laughs> see that's the word that's the words of an atheist that's the words of someone who doesn't believe in li li a future life they'll they'll live in, in our memories what consolation is that because th those people that remember them will soon die off Soon enough, you'll be forgotten. And, and therefore, if you are putting all your hopes in this life, you know, it, it's just foolish. It's futile. It's vanity. And so he says their inner thoughts is that they'll live on and, and if their name will live on if they, if they put their name on different things. But all of that is, is emptiness because this world is, is passing away. None of that is going to last praise God. And so we need to understand, uh, and that Proverbs 10.7 says, the name of the wicked will rot. And, and so even though if they die with a famous name, it'll gradually rot away until it be forgotten. So investing your hopes in this life and, and in riches and in your power and in your status is ultimately futile, is what he's saying. And he's saying they should realize that. It's, it's obvious. And therefore, they should be looking for something deeper. They should be looking for something that will survive death. And that's a relationship with God. All right. And then in verse 12, we come to the refrain, the first of the refrains, which kind of summarizes um, the first section that we've been talking about. He says, Nevertheless, man, though in honor, does not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. So this is the summary. He's saying all men, um, though in honor, even the richest and the most famous and most, uh, you know, men with the highest status, all of them do not remain. They do not remain on earth. They, they, it literally means they, they don't remain. They, they, don't lo they can't lodge on earth. Um, they can't stay here for long, is what it's saying. But actually, just like the animals, like the beasts, they perish. And what that means is it's the same for all mankind, the same outcome. 
all mankind will be forgotten, re replaced, as far as this world is concerned, just like the animals that die. What, what is he saying? He's saying how foolish it is to trust in your riches in this world, because all of that you're going to perish. And all of that you've tried to build here is, is going to perish. And therefore, that's the foolishness of trusting in this world and in this riches, because it's all going to pass away. And in that respect, you'll be, you're like an animal. The, the, it will be over. And that will be that. And, and therefore, your riches aren't going to help you when it comes to death. So the first section is basically saying that all, you're, all are going to die. And whether you're rich or poor or whatever, their riches isn't going to f do anything about that. Then we go into part two of the answer, which is the last few verses, verse 13 to 20. And here, the refrain is different in verse 20. But the whole section says that although... We're all equal as far as death is concerned, rich, poor, powerful, weak. We're all got a death, uh, you know, an appointment with death. As it says in Hebrews, it's appointed for all men to die once. But then it says, and after that comes judgment. And so we all die. But after death, there is a judgment, and it's the word crisis, which means a separation. In other words, as far as all of us is concerned, good, bad, beautiful, ugly, rich, poor, part one tells us, you know, we're, we're all going to die. But part two is going to tell us now, but there is going to be a big difference as to what happens to people after death. All right? Death, it's, we're all the same. But um, after death, we are going to go to one of two places. That's what, There's going to be one of two destinations. <clears throat> In this life, people are either on one road or another road. They're either on the road to destruction or on the road to life. And at death, it will be revealed which road you've been walking on. And there will be a clear difference at death. And this is the, the second you know, way that he answers the riddle. Um, verse 13, this is the way of those who are foolish and of their posterity who approve their sayings, Selah. And this word way can also be end. This is the destination. What he is now starting a new section in, and he's making an announcement. I'm going to tell you now what is the end. What is the destination for those who are foolish? And he, this word foolish means foolhardy or self-confident, senselessly secure. Let, let me try and explain that. These, these are foolish um, people. This is, the, this is the road they're on. He's, he's, he's calling it a road of folly. They, they're, what is this road of folly? They are uh, people who have a foolish self-confidence thinking that particularly nowadays that I can live any way that I like now I can go after those riches and hurt people and do what's necessary uh, and when it comes to my death that that's the end there is no God there's no afterlife um, and in their foolishness they choose to believe that they are senselessly secure they are self-confident thinking you know uh, there will be no consequences. There is no God. And, and though, though in those days, most everyone would claim to believe in God, people can claim they believe in God, but the way they live their life denies that fact. Because they live their life as if there is no God, as if there is no judgment, as if there is no consequences to what they do. So deep in their heart, they don't believe in God. Deep in their heart, they're foolish. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And so they're in the face of death, they're foolhardy. They've been warned. But people who, who commit crimes and so on, they are called the foolish. They're foolhardy. They, they don't even think about the, the eternal consequences of their sin. They don't think about the danger of hell. They're senselessly secure, thinking that nothing bad is going to happen to them. 
through this. And that's the, the way of the foolish, just being selfish and not thinking about that they're going to have to pay a price at some point, that just they will face justice at some point. And, um, and they will, if not in this life, in eternity. And so he is now making the announcement. He says, this is the way or this is the end of those who have this foolish self-confidence that they can, they can beat justice. And then he says, it's not, I'm not just talking about the, the, the rich, all right? He says, I'm also talking about the posterity who approve their sayings. So it's not just the, the people who are actually rich. There are also people who look up to the rich people, the, those rich, successful, godless people, and they approve their sayings. They approve their philosophy of life because they think, oh, well, it could be because they want to benefit from the rich. So you're always going to talk nice, you know, to the boss. You know, you're going to approve what he says because otherwise I might get benefit from that. Uh, but also they embrace that godless philosophy of this person and they try and imitate them. And, and even if they may not be rich themselves, but nevertheless, they, they embrace that philosophy of I've got to chase that money. I've got to try and be like that rich. I look up to that rich person who seems to have it all. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to get that. They embrace that same materialistic philosophy. And in do, doing so, they, they give no attention or love to God. And so you can trust in riches even if you don't have any riches. Because that's where your heart is. A lust for that. And so he then says, Selah. All right, and, and it's a funny place to put the salah, which means kind of pause, have a think about that. And I think this is, he's, he's announcing, this is, this is going to be the outcome for those who are foolish. And for those who follow their philosophy, salah. In other words, just pause, get ready for it, because something big is going to happen. He's, he's about to make a big point. So in a way, the Salah is the preparation for what's going to come next. And here and now, he really brings out his big guns. And, you know, it's right to warn people about hell. Uh, and this is what he's going to do now. Verse 14, like sheep. Remember, he says, everyone's going to die like an animal in that sense. Their physical body is going to die. They can't escape it. And, and now he talks about sheep. He compares these unbelievers to sheep. Um, and I think he chooses sheep because uh, sheep in particular are totally impotent in death. There's nothing, when, when the farmer takes the sheep to the slaughter, the, the sheep can do nothing about it. They're, they're impotent, they're, they, they have no ability to fight or, or resist or anything like that. And so these sheep, they're like sheep. When it comes to death, even the richest, most powerful man is defenseless against death when it comes to him. And he says, like sheep, they are laid in the grave. And actually, this word grave, people get confused. They think they, it's actually the word shale. And some people think Sheol just means the grave. The it's a physical word. But actually, no, Sheol is the place. Death takes the body, and the body goes in the grave, but Sheol takes the soul, or Hades takes the soul. And when somebody leaves their body, if they're an unbeliever, their soul leaves their body, and it goes down into Sheol, into Hades. And, and that's not a nice place. If you read Luke... 16, the rich man and Lazarus, you'll see what Sheol is like. It is actually a place of punishment. And, um, and, and it's a holding cell until the final place of punishment, which is the lake of fire. But he says that these unbelievers, what he's going to say here is there's a difference after death. Everyone has to die, but after death there's a difference. And in particular, he, what, what happens to this ungodly person who just trusted in his riches, he will be like, like a sheep that's slaughtered, and then he will be taken into Sheol, into that realm where the dead spirits go. And, and the literal translation I like is, as sheep for Sheol, they have set themselves. It, it, in other words, it's according to their own decision. 
they they are going to Sheol. Or another translation would be, like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. And then the next phrase is also very strong. Death shall feed on them. Death shall feed on them. But the more literal translation, which is better, the better translation is, death shall be their shepherd. And this is a terrifying thought that death... Death comes for you at some point. Physical death comes for you and then is your shepherd. And a sheep is under the authority of his shepherd. The shepherd owns him. And the, the, the shepherd leads him where he should go. And at death, it says, death doesn't just, he doesn't just die. But now death is his shepherd that leads him to Sheol, takes his soul, and it goes to Sheol. And this is the opposite of Psalm 23 that says, for the believer, the Lord is our shepherd. And this is a great promise that when a believer dies, because you've put yourself into the hands of Jesus, you've trusted, you're not trusting in your riches you're trusting in Jesus Christ, you've received him as your shepherd, you belong to him, when it comes to your death, because you've surrendered yourself into his hands, he will take you at your death, he'll take your soul, and rather than your soul being ushered down into Sheol, your soul is going to be taken up to glory. Praise God, because Jesus is your shepherd. But for the one who has not received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, death will be their shepherd, and death is going to take them down into Sheol. Strong stuff. And then he contrasts believers. In the second half of verse 14, he says the upright, all right, those who are living unto God, the upright shall have dominion or shall rule over them in the morning. And, and what, what he's saying is that there is a day coming and the morning is when the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. The morning is when God will manifest his glory and this, we think of this as the, as the coming of Christ. The morning is the, the time when he is going to bring in a, a new eternal day. Um, in the morning is when the righteous will be resurrected. There, it's a reference that's in the morning is used about resurrection. All right, you sleep in the night, that's like death, but then in the morning, the resurrection morning, God, this is part of biblical imagery, God will raise, raise up the righteous and, and we will enter into a new eternal day. And so this is the promise that ultimately the, the righteous will be resurrected and glorified. And in that day, there will be a total change. Before, that rich, powerful man was over you, maybe oppressing you. But in the morning, in when God brings in the, the new day, the righteous will, he might have been poor in this life, but he will rule over the unrighteous. There will be a total reversal of status. As Jesus said, the last will be first, the first will be last. And so the upright will have dominion over them in the morning. So it's talking about there's a future day. There's a difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. Yes, we all die, but after death, they've got a completely different destination. One, the unrighteous will be ushered into Sheol and eventually into the lake of fire, whereas the righteous will have a have a, a brand new eternal day to look forward to and then it say, then it goes back to describing the unrighteous very, in very strong language and their beauty shall be consumed in the grave far from their dwelling and uh, this word beauty means their form and and it's not some, the translation it says shall be consumed in the grave but again that's the word sheol so it's not just talking about the body. Now, of course, the beauty of a human body, even the most beautiful body, um, once it's in the grave, it's, it's going to rot. It's going to be consumed. So, yes, that's true. But actually, he's talking also about the soul. He's saying the form of the soul, as well as the body, will be consumed in Sheol. And, and the rotting... 
because this is the effect of sin you see you know when people see demons you know in a vision or or actually see them they're usually grotesque doesn't mean they were always like that they were some kind of personality but because of the effect of sin that twists and makes ugly the bible talks about the beauty of holiness holiness makes you beautiful on the inside but sin makes you ugly and so what it's saying is the rotting body in the grave is just a picture of what's happening in that person's soul if they go down to a place that's cut off from god they they their form will be become more and more grotesque uh a very dramatic thing this is it it's the word for corruption they will be corrupted in their soul as well as in their body and then it says the far from their dwelling or could this could be far from their princely mansions they weren't enjoying being in their lovely homes anymore the, probably a better translation is so there is no dwelling place for it th- their soul in other words their soul won't have a nice house to live in they won't have a nice dwelling place to live in because they will essentially be homeless because they will be in shale, which is really a prison. It's not a home, it's a prison. And so it's really saying shale will be their home. These are different translations. But the idea is they won't be in their nice dwelling that they maybe spent their life trying to get a nice house. No problem with that. But if they ignored God in the process, that's the problem. And... He says they're going to end up in this place. They'll end up homeless in this prison called Sheol. All right, verse 15. But, and here's the big verse coming in now, the big but, all right? This is the contrast now for believers, those who did not love money but love God instead. But, and this is a contrast with the previous verse which describes the unbeliever, It's also a contrast with verse 7 that says no man can redeem himself because now he's going to tell us who can redeem, who can pay the price to release a soul from hell. And this is now the big verse, the big revelation, you might say, a wonderful verse. But God, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. And again, this word grave is really shale. God will redeem my soul from the power of shale. This is a prophecy of the coming of Christ because when Christ came and died on the cross, he redeemed our soul. He paid the price with his precious blood to release our soul from shale. You see, Jesus did that in his death and resurrection. Remember, he says, I have the keys of death and Hades or shale. In other words, I have won the victory so I can set you free from Sheol. And I can set you free from the power of death. And he will in the future when he resurrects us. But actually what Jesus did uh, before the cross, Luke 16 tells us this, that all people, believers and unbelievers, went down to Sheol. Because Jesus hadn't done it yet. They went down to Sheol, but... But the believers went to a place called paradise. So it wasn't the pit. It was still in Sheol, but it was a paradise. But it wasn't heaven. It wasn't in the presence of God in heaven. But it was a nice place. Um, The unbelievers went down to the pit, if you like, to a place of punishment. Now, when Jesus paid the price, he went down to paradise. He went down to Hades. And he preached the gospel to them of what he had accomplished. And they, of course, all accepted him and they were all born again. And then he says he led captivity captive. He took them all up to heaven with him. So now all the Old Testament saints are no longer down there. They are actually up there in heaven. And when heaven is described, the new Jerusalem is described, it talks about in Hebrews 12, the spirits of just men made perfect. They were right, legally righteous, but now they made perfect through the new birth, and now their spirits are in the new Jerusalem in heaven. Praise God. So Jesus paid the price, and that's when he fulfilled it. This Old Testament saint says, this God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, and Jesus did that. He paid the price, and he released to release them out of Sheol, 
out of that prison and take them to heaven. Praise God. And so when every believer dies now, they don't go down to Sheol, they go up to heaven. And that's what Jesus announced in Matthew 16, 18. He says, on, on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, Sheol, will not prevail against it. So for all those who trust in him as the rock, as their rock, he's, he promises us we will not go through the gates of Hades. It will not prevail against us. In other words, we, we will go up to heaven because we'll be born again. Praise God. Our spirits have been made perfect. And, um, you know, there are other verses in the Old Testament that predict that God will do this redemption. God will pay the price. Um, and it's through the animal sacrifices it was also prophesied. Job 19.25, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he will stand at last on the earth. He will come to the earth to redeem me. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that I, I, in my flesh I will see God. He believed that he would be resurrected on the basis of that redemption. And then Hosea 13.14 says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave, Sheol. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, O shale, I will be your destruction. So God promised that he would come as the redeemer and he would pay the price, the ransom price, to deliver us from death. Praise God. And so the psalm says that wealth of any man cannot pay the price to save you from death and from shale. And those who trusting in their riches are going to find that out one day. And they'll be locked up forever in the darkness. But those who trust in, in, in God, in Christ, praise God, they, will, they, know, it's, they know that he has paid the price to redeem them from the power of death and will give them everlasting life. And they are delivered from Sheol. And then this wonderful verse, verse 15, finishes with another great phrase. God will redeem my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. He will receive me to himself. So he, he sees the future day when the Messiah comes. He'll pay the price to release him from Sheol. He'll be in paradise. And not just that, but God will receive him in heaven. He will, it's a word of personal fellowship. God will take me, literally, to himself. You, you can see him rising, entering heaven, and being received by God into the very presence of God in heaven. He shall receive me. Selah. He will take me to be with him. Psalm 73, 24. You will guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Praise God. It's also the word used about Enoch in Genesis 5.24, God took him. God received him to himself. So this is the revelation for the believer. is a glorious life after death. And now verse 16 to 20 just wraps it up. And verse 16 refers back to that riddle. Do you remember the riddle? Which is, I don't, I don't need to fear. How come? I don't need to fear. In the face of injustice and the wicked and the, the rich... Get seeming to get away with it. I'm not going to let that affect me. It's going to not make me jealous or want to be like them uh, or afraid of them. He's, he uses the same language here, you see, referring back to the... He, he's basically saying, therefore, in view of what I have shared with you, do not be afraid or do not be overwhelmed when someone becomes rich when the glory of his house is increased. You see this person get rich. Maybe this is an evil person. Don't be overwhelmed by that. Don't be in fear of that. Maybe because of the power it has. Don't, don't let it because it's just temporary. All right? When you see what his future will be, you won't, you won't be jealous of him. In fact, you'll have pity on him. Don't be afraid when one becomes rich, when the glory of his house is increased. In other words, value things correctly. There is an outward show, and there is an inward character. And what will matter in the long run is not outwardly how great you are, how rich you are, how powerful you are, how charismatic you are. What, will, what matters in the end is your character whether you are loyal to God or not, whether you're godly or not, because that will triumph in the end. 
That's what's going to matter in the end. So don't be overly impressed by the rich and powerful, is what he's saying. Verse 17. Why? And then he's really just reinforcing what he's already said. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. All right? All of that rich and power and status, he's not going to take any of it with him. We saw that already. His glory, which is his wealth, his honor, shall not descend after him. All right? And, and notice he talks about descending. His glory, his wealth, will not descend after him. In other words, he won't be able to take it with him. And notice he is descending, he's going down into Sheol, but he can't take any of the stuff or the status that he's accumulated in this life. And so don't be too impressed by his temporary glory, because he won't be able to take it with him. Verse 18. Though, but the opposite is true for the righteous, by the way, because we will be able to take our glory with us. And actually, there's a sense in which we can take our riches with us to heaven, because the Bible says, um, the Bible says that uh, you know, if we we can have, if we are generous with what we have now for God's purposes, we will have treasure in heaven. We can take it to heaven. All right, verse 18, though while he lives, he blesses himself, this could mean that he just uses the money for himself, he's being selfish, or it could mean that he's proud because of his, his riches and his success, he praises himself, and, and this is this self-confident boasting in his, in his rich, though he does that while he, while he riches, and then he says, for men will praise you when you do well for yourself, not only will he pr praise himself, but actually others will join in praising you and he will be deluded in his pride that he's this great person. And yet, he says, verse 19, he will go to the generation of his fathers. In other words, the, the generation is people, a group of people with a moral sim similar, similarity. The people who are like him with the same values and his fathers, will he will go to them. He will join with the company of the godless, and they will never see light. They'll never see the light of light. But this is a description of hell, where there is no presence of God. There's no light. There's no joy. There's no goodness. Nothing. All of that comes from God. It's called light. And in hell, they have chosen to reject God, and it's a place of utter darkness. And, and l everything that's good will be absent. It's the opposite of heaven, which is light. So don't, don't be jealous of him, don't be impressed by him, because that's where he's heading for. And then the last verse, verse 20, is the refrain that says, again, the man who is, or though he is in honor, though he may die in honor, yet does not understand, is like the beasts that perish. And what it's saying is slightly different now, is... The second refrain is saying that the first refrain said there's no difference. Everyone's going to die. But the second refrain is saying there is actually a big difference as to what happens after death. And the key is, he says, does he understand or does he not understand? The one who dies who does not understand, understand what? It's the spiritual understanding that this psalm is giving. All right? That that it's foolish to trust in your riches. It's foolish to build your self-worth on the, this world and to forget God. You, you, the, the wise thing is to face your sin, your mortality, and realize you can't redeem yourself. Only God can redeem you. And so put your trust in God. Love God. Trust God and he will be your shepherd. He will take you through death into eternal life. That is to have the spiritual understanding. And he says, you will have a glorious eternity. But the man, even though he's rich, when he dies, but he doesn't understand, he hasn't given, he hasn't thought about God. He hasn't got that spiritual understanding. He'll die like a beast, which means that's the end of him. He'll have no future. He'll be forgotten. And so this psalm presents a very strong message of not trusting in riches, but trust in God. And if you know the eternal outcome of those two groups of people, you won't be overly upset when the wicked seem to prosper and you won't be tempted to be like them. Well, God bless you. Uh, a very deep psalm. I hope you've benefited from its wisdom. Amen. Thank you.